the first on the agenda, we have our approval of minutes from our last meeting, which is June 12th. Um, if anyone has any updates today or changes. Um, all those in favor? for about 10 years but prior to that I was in North Carolina where I was the founder of Partnership for Watauga's Future which is Watauga County, North Carolina environmental group was very active there uh, students local legislation fighting against all kinds of neighborhoods since there was no zoning I wrote the proposal I actually had the opportunity to meet one of the candidates for the River Keepers uh, project that helped to uh, preserve uh, a river in Tennessee and North Carolina and wanted to find a way to uh, support the community here and an opportunity to come to this board. Uh, I joined it a couple of years ago. It's a great group of people and we welcome new members of Sunday to have uh, I'm Daniel Leonard. Um, I've been on the board for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, uh, my day job, I work for the University of Colorado Boulder in their research office, specifically uh, support researchers in bringing their technologies um, into practical applications in the market and throughout the world. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I was born and raised in Colorado, moved to Longmont four years ago, uh, and I'm really excited to dive in. I'm Mary Ben. I um, have a long background in sustainability. I, I founded a sustainable business network in Arizona. Um, 
led a sustainable cities conference at Prescott College, where I was the marketing director for six years. And um, spent a lot of that time uh, learning and writing about anthropology. Um, when I was younger, I worked on farms and such. And my husband is a farmer. He's um, left his transition from his tech job to starting a farm to family food cooperative. And he just got the only grant in this region from the USDA, $100,000, um, to start a food hub. So um, I have a big focus on life-based approaches to sustainability. Um, I've had meetings with uh, recently with the Boulder County Commissioner, um, Ashley Stolton, on pesticide issues. There's a big controversy going on there. The farmers are all in arms about that. Belong to the Front Range Farmers Coalition um, with my husband, and uh, very much focused on helping the city to uh, green the codes so that uh, transitions to um, life and nature based approaches like passive solar can happen in every neighborhood. I don't see Trump walls. Um, eliminating pesticides, um, building a regional food plan and food um, sustainability plan, uh, disturbing things coming out of the um, FDA about how they're not going to be maintaining our supply chains for us nationally anymore. We have to do that locally. Um, which is what part of why the food hub happened, and uh, eliminating pesticides and starting as much local growing on every scrap of land we can, which we're calling a project I haven't yet started, but I will, called Greater Bug, the Greater Boulder Urban Gardens Project. So that's... I'm Paul Kutz. I've been in the board for 10 minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm an urban planner, architect, uh, I have my own practice. I also teach as an adjunct at the University of Colorado Denver. Uh, even though I'm an urban planner, I have an uh, environmental studies doctorate. Uh, I focus upon regulations and adaptation. Uh, I just published a book about adaptation and it's all about localization of the assessment systems. Uh, I served as a commissioner uh, for the Historic Preservation Commission and two years in planning and zoning as well. So, that's it. Uh, Robert Davidson, um, this is my second term on the Sustainability Advisory Board, so thanks for having me back. Um, I spent the last almost 20 years now working on building efficiency projects, so that's been my area of expertise and I'm really passionate, or particularly passionate about just energy use and the efficiency that's it. I'm Ethan Lott Green. I'm new here. Of course, I ran for mayor last year at Walmart. And um, ride a bicycle everywhere, ride the bus all the time. And I did a master's degree in environmental leadership at the Europa, University of Boulder years ago and started the Pumal Culture Club there when this the single leadership award, the Justice Award, during the time of Europa. And I've done a lot of work in the environmental field for almost 20 years. And uh, from me to Colorado, I was in New Mexico, the law work for the Banner Farms in New Mexico. And uh, passionate about regenerative agriculture and climate action in general. I'm just saying some introductions, so you were folks. <laughs> I'm Becky Doyle, I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Integration, which is a department that includes our sustainability practice, as well as other uh, strategic uh, goals of the city, including data and analytics, and use of GIS, uh, City more efficient, collaborative, and sustainable, hopefully. Um, so, thank you. Welcome and welcome back. Yeah. And my name is Heather. I have been with the city for six, a little over six years. Um, I'm an executive assistant in strategic integration. I support our uh, assistant city manager for the utilities and his leadership team, as well as um, a lot of people in the department. So, um, and then I'm a reporting secretary for this board and also the water board, so you'll see a lot of communications from me. <laughs> Thank you.
you have questions, Heather probably knows the answers yeah. more than I do, but you can always reach out to me and I might loop in. <laughs> so, um, I know Wayne introduced himself and he'll have a chance to talk a little bit later. Susan, do you want to? Sure. Um, welcome um, to new folks and welcome back. I'm Susan Bartlett. I'm the Director of Energy Strategies and Solutions with Longmont Power and Communications, so we're your local municipally owned electric utility. And my team is largely responsible for customer engagement and uh, distributed in energy resources and a lot of the exciting things that are on our plate for the utility. And we have our media partner over. Do you want to say hello to oh. some people that we're Hi, I'm Eric. I work for uh, Monmouth Public Media and we record advisory boards and we'll have this up on YouTube in a couple of days. Thank you. You your cell phone. So hopefully, as you all um, will get to know, uh, we are a very um, informal board. We, if some of the other boards you'll see are tend to be more formal, um, I think we're a very vibrant and cordial bunch. So please feel free to you know chime in, make jokes, whatever you want to do, and holler if you have any questions. We do follow Robert's rules of order. Um, I did send you all some kind of welcome materials to help orient you. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> that Robert right there, so you get to make up the rules tonight. Um, but please don't be intimidated by that. Um, if if there's ever questions around you know, process or whatever, like Heather kind of jumped in earlier, and we'll help make sure that we're following the kind of those things. So, uh, as a, uh, so as an orientation to our new folks, but also a, a couple of things, um, these are always good refreshers, I think, for existing folks too, um, is that I thought might be helpful in addition to the documents that I emailed you all. One of the things that is, is relatively new ish anyway is the um, Longmont indicators page and we've started to move away from having our very lengthy and substantive plans like our sustainability plan and envision Longmont climate action plan themselves as a PDF online they're hard to navigate and as we're moving towards requirements around ADA compliance and things like that a lot of those didn't follow those ADA compliance rules and we're trying to move those things into a space that also makes them more engaging and interactive and easy for people to access. And part of the purpose of Longmont Indicators was also to start to show how a lot of the plans that we have in place, so the Sustainability Plan, Climate Action Plan, and Vision Longmont, the Beneficial Building Electrification Plan, and the Transportation Roadmap, also don't exist in isolation. So a lot of those things interact with one another. There's goals that we have that are supported by actions across those plans. And we're starting to try to show how those things are connected to one another. So one of the areas in which folks you would sometimes come to us and say, why isn't this piece of transportation in the sustainability plan? And we'd say, oh, well, we are doing that. It's just that particular strategy or action or goal is in Envision Longmont. Um, and it was kind of confusing for folks. And so what we've tried to do with this dashboard is to not only be able to show each of these plans, so you can click on each one of them. So it brings in all of the content from what, what are the PDFs, but it puts it into a more interactive format. So it goes through each of the topic areas. You can click on each of these. It'll show you all of the actions in there. You can click on them and go kind of as deep as you want into any of those things. Um, but also, if you go back to the home page, you can click on any of these tabs. So you click to actions. And what we built out was these overarching themes, um, which we tried to make as, as high level as possible, but to capture a lot of these. So you could click on, say, transportation, and it'll bring up all of the actions across all of those plans focused on transportation. And then similarly, you can go to the indicators page, um, and it'll show you all of our indicators. And you can click on these and see how well we're doing. What are our, 
targets and how well are we doing to meet those targets. So um, we'll make sure if you all don't have this that you have the link to this, but it's a great platform. We're pretty excited about it. We are adding the parks and open space plan in the coming months. Uh, we'll be adding the water efficiency plan once that's completed as well. Uh, and we, this is a very uh, dynamic platform that we'll be adding and modifying um, as we have new plans, as we meet our targets and goals and those sorts of things. But it's a great place to see what are we doing and how well are we doing in meeting the goals and targets that we have laid out. Um, so I want to point people toward that. Uh, the other thing that it has is this reports tab. So you can see um, our previous annual report. Uh, and then our we have a report kind of library if you want to see historical documents, information about um, the carbon disclosure project that we report to. And then if you really want to go deep on the greenhouse gas side, there is this what's called the scenario tool. Um, and this goes really specifically into our greenhouse gas inventory, um, our projections based on both business as usual, and if we implement all of the strategies that we have identified. And then there's an opportunity where you can go into each of these areas. Oh, oh. Um, it'll show you that area specifically, and then you can click in that um, actions themselves, and you can. Let me turn on it. Um, at the top, so you can do it in two different locations. At the very top, there's a tab that says "Act." Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, you can also that it's where it says "Expand so that you can kind of pull it up that way. So there's two different ways you can do the actions. Okay. Fancy worked very hard with the consultant help with this platform, so she knows all of these. But you can also go into the actions and you can kind of toggle these on and off and see how they impact our ability to meet our previous gas emissions targets. So uh, we hope this plan or this platform has something for everyone, how high level or how deep you want to go into. So, does anyone have any questions or anything? Um, we're pretty excited about it, but um, it's a great introduction into all of the sustainability and climate action plan things that we have going on. And how you get to it? Yep, it's eagleacres.mama.colorado.gov. Yep. We can send out that um, link for y'all too. Yeah. It's also linked to the city's website. It's linked to this button, a couple of different pages. Not like if you go to if you find our sustainability page, we would say you can track progress with the plan here. Same for it's linked to the official page on our website. So we try to cross link to the two websites. Hopefully, it should be pretty easy to find if you go on the website. The website. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're like navigating on our city website, you're like, I was expecting here. To link to here, like let me know. You know links. Yeah. I, I, you know, mentioned this before. It's a remarkable. Um, all of these documents are remarkable when you really delve into them. And for me, the uh, a very important thing is accessibility. And it is hard even for people who you, know, you guys are staff doing this all day long. And so I wonder um, how how much the community itself is accessing this and whether or not there are ways that we could work to make this a tool that helps to share education for the average person on the street because truly, you know, reading any of these, reading the plan, you know, I think it's like 170 pages or whatever, it's truly remarkable to show what our city has done. But my question is for the average person on the street, do they know all that we're doing? That's a, that's a great question, and I think that's a continuous effort for us. So, you know, Francie worked with our communications team earlier this year to do some rollout and try to get it out there as much as possible, um, sharing it with folks, 
like you all, and if you have other places that we can post it or share it whenever we do go to groups, when we work with, we do, as Nancy mentioned earlier, a lot of internal support. So one of the things that we do, even when we do with other divisions and work groups, is make sure that they know that this is available too. But I think that that will be an ongoing effort for us as sustainability outreach and education more in general it is, you know, a continuous effort for us as well as just to add, um, I recently met with one of our staff members who does more of the outreach and we talked about when possible we see opportunities to just link, like if it's even if it's like a program update, there's a, if either if it's related, like we don't even remember if you to get updates here. So we've talked a little bit about how to integrate that beyond just probably yearly. We'll do around the annual report a larger push and be like, don't forget about well, one indicators. And uh, the video that will pop up when you end is in progress. I have us put it on hold. Um, I realized uh, the scenario tool hadn't been translated into Spanish yet, so I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, section was translated into Spanish uh, before we finalize the video. But we're going to translate that uh, soon. We're just going to share with your updates. So I'm hoping the video will be up in the next couple of months. I'm really excited to hear. Yeah. I didn't realize that, that actually had gone forward. Yeah. Is there any media outreach, uh, you know, for instance, uh, has the Times call ever done any articles letting people know about these resources? I mean, obviously they cover all the individual fit projects and things when they're newsworthy. But again, I just think that there's such a depth of information here and so much work that you know our city has put into this that you know I want to see our neighbors know about this. We did a press release but I think it's like it's, that's not going to be a because we did one press release like we know that, that there's going to be ongoing the engagement as we get deeper I think about as we finish the park the open space it's not true. Right. <laughs> it's open. It's parks. Open space. Open space. It is the parks open space. Okay, for some reason I thought the trails were captured. So I didn't know. This week. But I think that's an opportunity. I think open space parks and trails. Parks, trails, recreation, and open space have to go. Open space has a separate floor. I knew something got different. It was different in there. So, anyway, when that one gets added, I think there's going to be continuous opportunities for us to. You know, do to kind of bring them back, bring it back to the surface, and say, "Hey, now you can see this online," and, and it's always going to reference back. And which is part of the intent of having this platform is to have one streamlined and consolidated place where people can go see all those things. So we're also going through the process right now of updating our website as an entire organization. So that's a big undertaking, and we'll hopefully create some more opportunities to do this as well. I say we, I don't have anything to do with that, but we as the organization, so. Well, also, with, um, as with many other things, the best um, form of communication is word of mouth. So as we as community members let people know, um, that is the fastest way to get the information out. We, you know, do a lot of communication throughout the city and we try a lot of different avenues, but word of mouth is really always the best form of communication. Yeah, we're trying to make sure our, our council members, like they've seen this and, and we've talked about it several times, but you know, you know, as, as they get contacted by constituents and with questions and things like that, you know, they make sure that they know that this is going to be so um, yeah. yeah. What's the frequency of data imports look like for it? Is that something that's happening annually or more regularly? We have, so we'll do an annual and mid-year report. Yeah, and some of the data we try to in, update the data, and Francie, correct me if I'm wrong, because Nancy's doing all of this right now. Um, in your data, we have it, but a lot of it is annual, and then we'll go from the Yeah, just a, and, and it is all annual data. We won't do like a halfway through the year data update, but some of our data, like I just did waste diversion data, isn't available until halfway through the year anyway. So that's where you'll kind of get some of those data updates at the end of the year, some of them in the middle of the year. And transportation data like in the fall so the it's always annual data it just kind of happens throughout but the the verbal updates that's the, the always consistent to us here. yeah and which data was a little more consistent than it's a little bit too fast <laughs> the consistent timeline but 
working on it. Yeah. <laughs> What's at least nice about the data is that if you're just up, uh, updating the a number, we I can do that at any point throughout the year. We don't have to limit it to uh, when we do the twice a year updates. We've got the transit the entire page for any written updates, but if it's just like that the 2023 is 10 percent, you can have that uh, at any point in the year, which is nice. Yeah, and so Francis mentioned a couple of times, but I'll just highlight that it is also available in Spanish, and it is not just, oh, not this one, just kidding, that's what Francis just said. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, and it's not just Google Transit, it is, it's actually manually translated, it's reviewed by folks to make sure that um, the transitions are. And if you happen to browse the Spanish version right now, you'll see that it is not currently matching with English because I actually we are finishing request for updates and tomorrow send it for translation. So we usually have a couple weeks where they're not perfectly matching, but we want to make sure we have that accurate translation. So the other thing that I just wanted to go through with folks um, for our our new folks, but then this is also so I have some updates for our existing folks. So every year at the beginning of the year, we'll talk through what do we have on the agenda for the year? What are some council priorities that we know are coming? Um, and then what are priorities for this board? So as you all know, being folks in the sustainability field, sustainability is a very big umbrella. There's lots of topics within that. There's lots of different directions that we could go. There's uh, lots of different things connected to, again, council priorities. We also have other boards that focus more specifically on certain topics. So we have our transportation board and we have our water board. Um, and so we, every year, kind of have a conversation in the beginning of the year to try to lay out what are the key topics and priorities for this board to focus on. And then I do my best to kind of build out this work plan for the year. It doesn't always exactly align because things get, you know, bumped around. Sometimes we have priorities that come up that we want to bring to this board that we didn't anticipate earlier in the year and whatnot. Um, but just to give you a sense of kind of what falls into that, we have sort of always our general business, which are kind of standing items, um, climate resilience, energy, um, electrification, since that's a key thing and a key priority for council, food systems, and land policies, natural environment, transportation, water, um, and then zero waste so those are um, key topic areas and then looking ahead to um, our August meeting so we'll have an update from Platte River Power Authority and their uh, integrated resource plan so they came to us earlier in the year to talk about that planning process uh, and then um, potentially some updates from landscaping code group, um, that we talked about a couple of months ago and then an update to the water efficiency plan. September I just wanted to flag for you all this is kind of a placeholder for key updates that depends on where some other things are at. Um, Hannah from Lama Power Communications is likely to come talk to us about distributed energy resources and renewable power plants. This is confirmed, so I did contact um, Michael, who we had talked to, Mary Lynn, a few months ago on the passive design standards, and so he's going to come and talk to you all about that. He's the um, architect who did the uh, passive block and um, prospect. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you chose me because I figured that he probably knew something about our code. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> issues. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then a couple yeah, other yeah. things, you'll see that like September, this is not necessarily everything that's going to be on the agenda, it's just because I've had to bump things from other months, so they kind of just get spread throughout the year. Uh, code cohort recommendations, so we've been participating in the Northwest Regional Code, Building Code cohort over the last couple of years, uh, looking specifically at things like energy efficiency, um, solar EV and building electrification to try to develop some consistency across the region as far as code requirements go. Uh, as we've been working on that, there's also been some code requirements that have come down from the state. And so as we are updating our building codes to align with the 2024 um, IECC, uh, we are working right now with a consultant to do some cost analysis of those code requirements. And then our building services folks 
are still waiting unless season. Clearly, the 15th has passed, and I don't think we have heard. We haven't heard a thing. Um, so, don't hold your breath. Still anxiously awaiting for code books to be available. They are quite late. Uh, so, this is also dependent on when we actually get those code books that we can confirm what is in them. But when we do have them and we have all of that information, we'll make sure to come to you all to have a pretty in depth conversation around what we're learning from that process, what those codes are, um, and then building services will be taking not to city council or their um, discussion and their direction as well regarding building codes. Um, and a couple of other things that we've talked about. So the conversation around regenerative agriculture, use of open space for ag and carbon sequestration and kind of how those things fit together. Uh, I've been in conversation with folks from our Parks and Natural Resources and Open Space group. Um, so they will be coming to us and potentially some other folks. I know we've talked about some other regional folks that have expertise in this area. Yeah. Should we move that to August? It looks like October and um, this is not. We do we have Flat River coming in August and potentially I can move it for yeah, we also have the mid year for. I can bump it. Um, Let's see. And I'm meeting with our open space folks, I think, in the next couple of weeks to make a plan for that presentation. Um, so it, it depends on what else is confirmed for the August agenda. Um, so, like I said, these things aren't beyond August, these things aren't set in stone because things get bumped around. But. And then we have um, the transportation mobility plan update. So, uh, I know Bill has come to you all, I think just one Excuse moment. Me. Lisa, can you let us know um, when you've confirmed when the Ag thing is happening? Because I'll ask Ben to come and give us an update on the future project. Okay, yeah. I mean, should, should he just come as public and having to be heard? Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the 287 update and our Vision Zero, uh, which is focused on um, transportation. And then probably, um, just a very quick final like letter of support or something like that with regards to the transportation mobility plan and then water efficiency plan. So, um, and then as existing folks know but new folks may not know, we always cancel our December meeting because it is right before the holidays and we learned a long time ago that we just so. <laughs> um, I always just, if we had a cookie exchange, very quick. <laughs> Maybe that's true. We could revisit closer if you all want to keep it. That's fine. It's just um, after years and years of doing this, <laughs> that's the discovery that it's. Um, or we could do something just celebratory. We could revisit that closer too. Um, so, and then another kind of standing piece is that we do have the Boulder County. I would be real about the sustainability tax for short, but it's the environmental sustainability matching grant program. Um, that usually opens sometime in the fall, and we always require a letter of support from this board as we identify projects for that grant. So that will show up sometime in the fall as well. That date sometimes we do want to go up. So, yeah, that just orients kind of new folks of what are some of the topics that have been on the agenda and priority list for this year and what we will see. Please don't hold me to any of this because there's a lot of tentativeness as I'm trying to keep stepping Are there, um, trying to structure, um, are there opportunities where we engage directly with the community, like town halls with the board, or, uh, you know, aside from you know, the public hearing within meetings, but a more general or, or more even casual engagement with the community? Do that? That's a great question. Um, I yeah, I think typically we haven't done that other than public invited to be heard. And it's always open. We have often asked you all to be volunteers at events that we do tabling and stuff at to help just provide general like sustainability information and, and things like that. Um, but mostly as an advisory board to city council. I mean, sometimes we do bring folks, you know, 
Um, Michael from the passive design stuff is an example. You know, we'll often bring folks from the outside to do presentations or provide information and that kind of stuff. But um, usually, it's you all providing feedback directly to staff, or in some cases, um, providing memos or recommendations directly to staff. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, um, is, are there any updates on who's if we're going to have a new board sponsor? No, it'll stay the same. So, oh, okay. sorry, folks are are not familiar. Um, Marsha Martin is our council leader. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, there's. Uh, she should have pressed release a vote whether or not she's going to be. Oh, okay. That's not right. She's actually decided by the end of the year if she's going to. Oh, okay. Resign. So if she does step down, then then yes, we would end up. Well, I would just say board that board. I mean, since the issue is whether or not she can be here, I would rather have a board liaison that can actually attend our meetings. So, and I don't know how we would give our input on that. We can bring that concern to you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, related to that, I think public outreach is very important. Uh, I was involved in Chitaslo and I, I'm from Turkey. I was in a small town that's a, a member of Chitaslo. And the taxi driver knew all the rules to apply for Chitaslo. And that was very impressive. You know, the Chitaslo, one of the chunk of the criteria is how aware people are mm -hmm. And when you mentioned that, Remember how impressed I was with the taxi driver. <laughs> so maybe there's another chunk of tasks to outreach and make people aware. Yeah, I think that that's. I, I think that that is a really critical piece. We are. I will say that I think we've had a lot of turnover in our communications department mm -hmm. um, and are in the process of hiring a new director for that right now and I think having that in place will will help our team does a lot of community engagement. We work a lot with Lane and his team that does a lot of neighborhood based mm -hmm. outreach that's so speak to I think one of the other efforts that we have underway is some of us from sustainability and the city manager's office and community neighborhood resources is looking at even accessibility of participation in things like boards and commissions or other groups like we have an equitable climate action team we have our sustainability coalition which i know you participated in a long long time ago in the very beginning um we have a bicycle issues committee we have things like that but we don't have a great sense of how aware are people of those opportunities to participate participate how accessible are they? What are the barriers in place? And so we're working right now to put some surveys and things like that together to get a better understanding of that piece of it, which you know is just one piece. Um, Wayne, and maybe I'll put you on the spot when you come up to talk more broadly about the Neighborhood Group Leaders Association, because I think that's a pretty unique thing that Longmont has as a conduit to speak directly to neighborhoods and things like that. But I think from a capacity and resources standpoint, we're always looking on how we can best mm -hmm. leverage that to get more information out to more people. We might very well. I think we should be doing our strategic planning through the NIGLA. That's what I call them. <laughs> through the NIGLAs. Um, so, in the review process, is there a position opening in the fall? No, I just have those as placeholders from one year to the next because that's so I don't forget because that's a pretty new thing that we just introduced in the last couple of years. So I can make sure to build it into the agenda if we need to talk about um, do we have a selection committee or do we go into it. So I just need to get space on the agenda. So it's just a reminder for myself. Typically, the sustainability advisory board does their um, recruitment in the spring, though, or the because our terms go from July to June. So. Mm -hmm. Usually do the midterm uh, recruitment, yeah. the mid mid year, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Well, I know that was kind of a lot, so feel free to reach out anytime, as I said, and then we'll hand it back to Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just pulled it. I go wait. I was trying to pull my agenda back up. Um, yeah. So given that we had um, our some transition of folks midterm, we need to do an election election of a new vice chair. So Michelle is our chair. Um, so I move to nominate Mary Lynn for additional vice chair. I'll second that. Just because I've been here the longest. <laughs> I don't really Are you okay with that? No, I'm just saying, if you want to turn around and nominate Alex. All right, if he doesn't do it, I'm going to nominate. Could you remind everybody what the responsibilities of the vice chair are? And what the salary is. Yes, the salary is, you know, the hand sanitizer you can utilize. Which is a 200% raise. <laughs> Perhaps a cookie exchange should you decide to organize one. Um, yes, mostly the, the vice chair serves in the role to step in in the off chance that the chair is not available to you. Pretty, pretty low key. My friend is always going too fast. The next thing I want to say, I remember the Roberts were divorced. Not a good choice. Is there any, anyone else that is? I'm certainly willing to do it. No one else wants to. Yeah. <laughs> I nominate Roberts yeah. <laughs> to keep us on the rules of order. Oh, there we go. Is there a second for Robert? All those in favor? <laughs> Any more proposed? <clears throat> Any further discussion? All right. You guys here? Robert Davis. All right. All right. Keep up the good attendance. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was going to say, actually, I should have forewarned for people that Michelle will be stepping out for a little bit. <laughs> 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 I was like, I might have like a two-week old. <laughs> yes. so you, you may very well get to step in this chair. Maybe it's always welcome if, if you so choose. Um, great. Um, Michelle, now I'm okay. right. Um, do we have any, we have any, we don't have any public events we heard today. Um, okay, so we have our um, request for sustainable neighborhood solutions grant community volunteers. Do you want to come on up here? Do you want to sit in my seat? I've got a lot of stuff here. I've done worse. <laughs> uh, I'll be moved to have the room. Yeah. And then you can do that um, presentation. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. Yeah, we'll just click on it and we'll go to the next one. Okay. Oh, yeah, we'll <laughs> Just having a, an error. Uh, anyway, uh, well, hello everybody. Um, uh, so I, as I said before, I'm Wayne Tomek, I'm the Neighborhood Resource Coordinator. Uh, so the, the pretext for this is that we have a committee and we need a representative from this group to serve on that committee. What I'm going to do, especially since a lot of you are new, is give just a real brief presentation. I'll take a little more detail if you want me to. Um, but just to give you a little context about what we're actually, you know, why we're asking you to be on the committee. Um, you said just tell people where your group sits in the context of your group. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it is not there. I tried to keep it very simple because I didn't know exactly you know, how much time, etc. we're going to have. Uh, so I am based in community and neighborhood resources. Um, uh, 
which we did the same division, we're under the same department. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of restructuring recently, I'm still getting used to where we are. Um, which, which is actually nice, it shifted us, we used to be in community services, uh, and now it's kind of changed uh, last year, I guess. Um, and it's kind of brought us into the same, the, 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 across the kind of the same sphere in terms of sustainability, et cetera, it is um, partially to make us more available to more of the organization. Um, especially uh, because a lot of the work we do is um, focused on community engagement, uh, especially at the neighborhood uh, level. Uh, and we also do a lot of work in uh, conflict resolution, community relations, that kind of space as well, uh, in the social equity uh, world as well. No one, no, no, part of me. <laughs> Can you give us the, the one minute on what is the NGLA? Yes, that's going to be okay, next slide. I'll go a little bit more deeper than I was going to on it. Okay. Um, but, but please, if it was okay, just ask questions about anything. Um, I may not have put enough detail in some of this. Uh, so, uh, so, first of all, that kind of neighborhood context. Uh, that should be <laughs> uh, so, so, the context, so the Neighborhood Group Business Association um, uh, is a network of neighborhood based community groups. Uh, we make that distinction because there's a lot of different types of community groups. We won't go into too much detail. We specifically focus on geographically based uh, neighborhoods. Uh, those neighborhood boundaries are defined by those neighborhoods, uh, uh, as opposed to neighborhood districts that the city has created um, that we use for, for data interpretation and that. Uh, some are ma mapping projects that we're working on right now. Uh, so uh, right now we have about 40 uh, active neighborhoods. Uh, those neighborhoods uh, uh, register uh, with us. Uh, we consider them active groups when they register with us and they have attended at least two of our monthly meetings that the NGOA uh, holds. Uh, so they can be registered with us and not have attended those and they're, just, they're inactive. Um, we also have about another 50 neighborhoods that have been registered at some point. Um, the, I'm, I'm very I'm happy, I can finally say, we've always been kind of searching for where did the NGLA start. Uh, I've never been able to find that date. Uh, we know approximately, we finally found a document that officially said that it started in 1986. Um, partially in response to some, um, some violence and different things that were happening in neighborhoods around Longmont. Uh, anyone who's been around Longmont for a while knows that uh, there was some some issues in the city around that time, uh, the, the mid 80s, the mid 90s. Uh, and part of the response was that, that we needed better communication with our neighborhoods. Uh, and so um, the NGLA was set up at that time. Uh, and so, really, uh, one of our roles uh, is to support those groups to build the capacity, provide resources, funding, uh, other support to build the strength of those groups, help make sure that they uh, are representative of the neighborhoods. And uh, one of the primary goals is for them to help create a two-way uh, two uh, communication between the city and our residents. Uh, so we see the, uh, the representatives, so they come together, we have a process for doing that. Those neighborhoods elect representatives that attend general meetings, uh, 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 serve as kind of a voice of the neighborhood uh, as well. And when we have, we, uh, have it, uh, concerns that we need to deal with them. Uh, uh, and uh, kind of help facilitate that, that conversation, hopefully collect a voice um, that works to varying degrees uh, right now. But we're doing a, a number of things to try to increase our ability to kind of serve them and build their capacity uh, right now. But one last thing I'll note from, from that perspective, uh, well, two things. One, the, 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 there's kind of four primary areas that we uh, uh, help them focus on, which is building a sense of community, uh, improving quality of life, uh, focusing on sustainability and resilience within their neighborhood boundaries. Um, uh, and, and so obviously that sustainability and resilience is kind of a new thing as we have formed partnerships over the last years, number of years now, that's been a while, uh, with, with sustainability. Um, uh, the, the, the other distinction I wanted to make is that, uh, so you might be wondering uh, about homeowners associations. So we make a distinction between a homeowners association and a neighborhood group. Uh, Many of our neighbor groups are, are in a HOA neighborhood, uh, and that's fine. We, we, we make this distinction uh, because uh, HOAs are by uh, their nature exclusive to, to homeowners. 
Uh, we require that our neighborhood groups be inclusive, so we have renters, etc. Uh, and we work with, with the neighborhoods to try to make sure they're representative of everybody who's in whatever their demographics are of that neighborhood. Uh, about 85% of the registered neighborhoods right now have HOAs. The others are independent. Some of them have multiple HOAs that combined. Uh, which is right about uh, we believe representative of kind of the city as well. And I heard that the city board said that about how many are there in the Very difficult question to answer. Uh, partially because we've traditionally allowed them to define their own. Mm -hmm. So we have I think uh, seventy neighborhood districts I think that we created. Um, but neighbor boundaries are often much smaller than that. Uh, they tend to follow the HOA boundaries or subdivision boundaries, that kind of thing. Um, it depends on how those those boundaries get defined in the neighborhoods that aren't currently registered. Uh, ideally, I think we would be around 100. Uh, realistically, if we looked at, for example, subdivisions, um, I don't know if remember, knows how many subdivisions there is. Uh, many more than 100 subdivisions. Uh, I think it, it was at that scale, and, and so we've been working with them to try to define larger boundaries, more realistic what a neighborhood is, rather than you know these small kind of townhome subdivisions. Uh, but that's kind of a newer approach. Uh, and so part of what I really want to get to tonight is that so we uh, two of the primary grants that we have uh, given out in recent years. Um, made available to, to uh, active neighborhoods uh, is the Neighborhood Improvement Program Grant and Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Grant. Uh, the Neighborhood Improvement Program has been uh, around for about 30 years, uh, different variations. The Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Grant, SNS, uh, is newer, it's been around for about five years, four years. That's COVID. <laughs> we only during COVID, it's very good time. <laughs> Um, and, and we've gotten to a point where that, that's matured a little bit. We've seen some areas uh, where we think we can have improvements. So this year we've been going through a restructuring uh, to partially unify those, but better take advantage of our resources, make it a little bit easier and clearer for the neighborhood groups to apply. We're always trying to kind of remove barriers to make it easier so that they're spending their time and effort on actual projects. Is there a particular calendar, or if, or is there a basket of money, and if a neighborhood decides they want to do something, they come in and speak, or is there an application period? How does the process work for having funds flow to the neighborhoods if there's something they want to do? Uh, I'm going. That's what I'm going to it's talk about. Slide, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I don't outline it enough, let's come back and I'll, I'll fill it. Uh, with. with um, Creating the, the neighborhood so, uh, associations, is that an active solicitation the city is doing, or is that something we expect the neighborhoods to come to the city to request? Does that make sense? It's a good question. It's a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, so um, I would say traditionally we have waited for neighborhoods to come to us, yeah. uh, and it but kind of been ready. We have had a process to, uh, uh, it's not something where they just give us an application and they're, you know. We go through a process where they need to kind of form a leadership team, reach out to the community, etc. Um, more recently, we've kind of been developing a program. Um, uh, we actually just launched uh, kind of the pilot version of that this week on Monday, um, where we uh, will kind of take neighborhoods through uh, a very specific process uh, to build their capacity a little bit better, uh, probably before uh, they join the interior line. Also, for existing groups to kind of go through and build that process. Through that, we've been a little bit more active about reaching out and targeting neighborhoods. Um, we prioritize, especially uh, in the first few years, uh, looking at neighborhoods with demographics that don't traditionally participate. Um, you know, especially uh, neighborhoods of high, high rental, for example, right? Less likely to, to come from the other. And we build the process a little bit around that. So, much more targeting moving forward. Um, yeah. uh, so just a little more on the Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Program and the grant within that. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a unique partnership that we created uh, a number of years ago now, uh, really focused on kind of preparing our neighborhood groups as partners, uh, uh, really active uh, in, in, in promoting sustainability, uh, based partially on um, a sustainability theory that was developed in uh, Great Britain. 
around the idea that you know government has a certain role, obviously, you guys are that, to further sustainability, um, but that that's probably not enough to really reach the goals we want to, that we need the business nonprofit community, we need residents to all play a role in that. Uh, and so this helps take us in, uh, and pair those neighborhood groups to, and the residents within there to, to be partners in this process. Uh, so uh, as we initially set up, obviously the city uh, through sustainability and community with resources as a partner, the Longmont Community Foundation has, has been a wonderful partner uh, in the process as well. We've set up a uh, impact fund that uh, is where the, kind of the funding lives uh, for this project. Um, and, 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 and it gives us the opportunity to kind of pull in dollars from outside the city, so it's not just relying on city resources uh, moving forward. And then obviously our, our community members, that is the local partner. Um, so I'm gonna, this can be a little complicated, this is why I want to do a, do a graphic. Uh, again, this is the restructure, so anyone who might have had some familiarity with these grants in the past, uh, it will look a little bit different. Uh, it's kind of, it's different, but it's not that different. It's kind of a, a matching together of what these grants were before. Um, so we essentially have four grants. Um, okay, so what is current now under the sustainable neighborhood solutions uh, moniker? On, and we have 10,000 a year that the city allocates to this one. Um, uh, the first one are what we call workshops and activities, and I'm not going to go too deep into this. I'm happy to answer questions if you want. Um, the, these are kind of very short-term, one-off kind of programs. Uh, we have funded things like uh, a workshop on rain barrels. What are they? How, do you, how would you implement them in your own home? That kind of very educational, you know, one, two-hour kind of, kind of program. Um, so you see, you'll see kind of three funding categories here. The main one, uh, the thousand dollars, that is what is available to an active neighborhood uh, who has also participated in our neighborhood leadership series, which is a series of trainings that we offer, um, part have partially focused on HOA board development um, uh, uh, and partially focused on general kind of neighborhood leadership skills. Um, for example, in August we'll be doing a a water conservation series. So. A series of people focus on water conservation at the neighborhood level where we'll, we'll talk about what does that mean, what are the kind of projects you can do, what resources, grants, etc., are available to you, and then they'll culminate with a tool that we'll do with some, some gardens around town. The city's worked on that some gardens have worked on. Um, so if you participate in that, which is kind of our expectation within the last four months, anyone from your neighborhood, then you qualify for kind of that base amount. If you have no one in your neighborhood has participated in the last 12 months, then it's that no NLS category. So you can see this grant is $1,000. If you have, it goes down to 250 if you haven't. Only accessible to active neighborhoods as well. Um, and then we also have for the sustainability grants a what we call holistic bonus. Uh, so the expectation you'll see on the benefit category is sustainability. You have to be furthering one of the sustainability topic areas to qualify. Um, if that well, project's uh, substant substantively furthers more than one category, uh, then you can get the holistic bonus as well. Uh, to be clear with that, we don't the, uh, a lot of benefits that you can say are you know, sustainable benefits, you could qualify under multiple categories, right? Because this is a water conservation or maybe a natural environment, etc. That we don't count. It's got to be substantively different. We're, we're, uh, the example I always use is a few years ago we funded a, a turf remover, removal pollinator garden. Um, and so that kind of qualified, well, they could have put that in a number of different categories, but really it's the same benefit. So they qualified that way. Um, it was, uh, they also uh, included an educational program to teach local kids and uh, neighbors about pollinators and why is it important to do a pollinator garden and why should they consider uh, you know, removing their grass and doing a pollinator garden. That is a totally different benefit that they've created through that project that will qualify for that bonus. So something that exists there, we want to encourage those kind of more holistic views of sustainability, but also acknowledge that that's really rare. Um, and we really have a, kind of a high standard for whether a project would qualify for that bonus. Um, so the second category uh, of grant under the SNS is programs and resources. These are kind of more long-term uh, assets uh, in the community, not really a one-time thing, um, but you may, you may be funding for kind of the setup costs, for example. Uh, it may be, maybe you want to set up a youth sustainability club uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, and so you use this grant made for some of the setup costs to get it going. It won't fund it over time, 
uh, uh, what you would from that initial uh, effort. Uh, this, where we've been using this most over the last couple of years, uh, we've had a number of neighborhoods who have been um, creating uh, water conservation master plans, landscape master plans for water conservation in the neighborhood. Um, uh, so that they is a they can look at that as a kind of stepped coordinated effort of improvement over time because they can't afford to do the whole neighborhood at once. Uh, but then that can kind of create a structure of you know this year we're going to do this project and next year we're going to do this uh, project. Uh, and so a lot of communities have, have, have taken interest and started using it that way. You can see the base amount is five thousand for that. Uh, I should note that the approval on both these is the SNS committee, so that's why I'm kind of going into detail. Uh, and, the, and then the sustainability categories. Uh, so then uh, we shift to the neighborhood improvement program. Uh, uh, and, and this is a change where one of the grants that was traditionally under the SNS program to actually shifted to the NLP. Um, that uh, one of the primary reasons is for um, uh, resource availability. So we can use resources a little bit more efficiently. Um, because as you can see, the NIP has $50,000 is accessible to it. Uh, and, and so yeah, I'll explain more about that here in a second. Uh, so first of all, um, again, two grants available. The first one doesn't apply to this committee. Uh, those are neighborhood enhancement projects, which are similar to the traditional neighborhood improvement program grants that we've given, uh, which are, have not been tied to sustainability. You know, we've kind of been encouraging that in recent years. Um, there are four uh, separate categories, uh, quality of life categories, that needs to fit into one of those uh, uh, sections. We, you can see it's $6,000. We kept this uh, the, uh, primarily because we have a, a lot of projects that maybe could qualify under sustainability, but what we found is that can also kind of water down the sustainability value of every project to say, oh yeah, we, we fit into this category, right? And we didn't want to see that happen. Uh, and we have a lot of smaller projects that are really valuable that maybe don't really fit real well in sustainability. We don't want to force that, even though they're really good quality projects improving the um, uh, But so we have a, uh, a NIP committee which is made up of uh, representatives within NGOA who approve these grants. Uh, and then the final category is kind of joined together those, we call them the sustainable improvement projects. So these are for larger, uh, usually kind of more tangible physical project improvements within the neighborhood. Uh, you can see that uh, one of the benefits of doing this is we've been able to really increase the eligibility amount up to $12,000 per project. Uh, and the monthly bonus is really significant. Uh, you can see why uh, we would want to give that out on a regular basis at that uh, amount. Uh, I have found that if you just say your money is available, uh, people will apply for that. Uh, most of the amount is available. So we, we kind of discourage neighborhoods to make sure that you really are building a project that's deserving of that. Um, we're not just going to give that away to every project that says we're really, uh, doing that. Um, being that this is more substantial, both the SS committee and the NIP committee both review these grants. Um, it has to get approved from, from both committees now, so that's a little bit different. Um, uh, it still meets the sustainability category. And with both the NIP grants, uh, the neighborhood is also required to do a presentation to the NGO land um, at the, the, the meeting. Um, what are some of the examples of the sustainable improvement? So uh, we've done a number of, kind of turf removal projects, uh, pollinate, pollinated gardens uh, types of things. Um, that is dominant. Water conservation projects is dominant in this year for obvious reasons, especially among the HOAs uh, where water costs are really have you ever felt that any community gardens? Uh, we we uh, have not done it. I've had a couple communities who have asked about that. Um, that's a complicated one. The uh, city has supported those in the past. Um, we would potentially support it, but there's a lot of details that we would expect uh, before we would support that one. And, 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 and uh, um, yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, so getting to something a little bit more tangible, well, I'm going to kind of skip through this. So uh, the categories that we accept, so the sustainability categories, right, has to be tied to improving one of these. You're very familiar with the 10 in the sustainability plan, uh, I assume. Uh, you, we, we, we kind of divide them up for clarity, 
we're, like we're talking to neighborhood groups that maybe don't have a lot of knowledge of sustainability, right? So it's also kind of an educational piece that we're doing. Uh, so we divide it up in kind of the people, the you know, people plan the prosperity structure to make that a little easier for folks. The plan in one, pretty straight and simple uh, to the sustainability plan. Uh, we do, because of the neighborhood focus, add a couple of categories to those 10, four to, to be specific. Um, the community and cohesion one is kind of what justifies a lot of our projects and, and, and this program in general. Uh, then you can see we actually add a education, health, and public safety um, because we find a lot of you know that's important at the neighborhood level, uh, and we want to, uh, to to acknowledge that and allow them to do those kinds of projects. And then finally, in the prosperity category, um, we have uh, economic vitality, of course, and then we added self sufficiency, which is really more the neighborhood self sufficiency. Um, you know, we want them to get to where they can deal with issues, for example, if things arise, and they really have the capacity and ability to know how to, how to resolve those things. Uh, and hopefully that reduces some of the burden on the city uh, as well. If they can do that. Um, and then you'll see you know, the, the NIP, the four NIP categories, a little bit more basic. But some of those grants might also fit into sustainability companies. Uh, what about disaster preparedness? Uh, so especially with natural disasters, the neighborhood communities are almost exclusively relied on in the, in the moment. So I'm just wondering if, that, uh, if that's been considered a, as an option. Uh, absolutely, not as a separate category yeah. uh, that we've defined. Uh, I think it could fit into multiple categories here, uh, right? Um, but we have had some conversations with our emergency management office um, and, and others about what, what could that look like at neighborhood level, how could we support kind of neighborhood planning um, for the, that kind of thing. It's kind of a new thing to consider uh, neighborhoods as an asset in that, especially in kind of the pre-planning process. Um, but I think we're increasingly understanding that value. Uh, I mean, we, we have, simply having a neighborhood group is a huge value. We've right. seen that with the floods and, and you know, 2013 floods, et cetera. Um, but yeah, having a little bit more coordinated effort beforehand. Um, so that, that might be, um, I didn't go into today, but we have a project library that we're developing uh, because it is like, okay, my neighbor wants to do something, what, what do I do here? Uh, so we're developing a project library that have a kind of examples, resources, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's one of the kind of projects we've talked about including in that we haven't done. Yeah, we're trying to develop in like some kind of turnkey projects that already yeah. have like a budget built out and some you know some people can take some of the work off the neighborhoods themselves, some of the work on the design. And is that something where the, the association would or the, the um, Sorry, mixing up names. But the association as a whole would support the neighborhoods if they wanted to go out and find other funding to fund, uh, you know, to apply to a nonprofit or a state program to support their project. If, if this grant didn't come through for them, but they can pursue other financing options. So, so we, the staff, would kind of support them in that effort. Um, that can be challenging because most of our neighborhood groups are not 501c3s. So they're not kind of official right. entities, and it can be. You know, difficult to get grants uh, from that perspective. Uh, as a traditionally, that that's not really where funders have seen value. Um, but we would support a neighborhood that kind of found a grant that they wanted to, to, to do that with. Uh, and we, we, we have on, on some occasions been able to kind of support neighborhoods that way. Not within the emergency management yet. But, yeah. Can we pass it into the neighborhood that needs more than others? Yeah, that's a, another that's yeah, a good yeah, compliment. That's water conservation grant that's targets neighborhoods as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Northern Water has their relatively new, three years old, I guess, uh, grant for HOAs. Uh, and we have had a number of neighborhoods kind of have worked there. I don't know how many in total, but uh, I think maybe three, at least two or three, who've received that grant in Northern Water. Some of them have used that uh, in combination with our grants as well. Right. Um, and we have a, at least two or three neighborhoods who are also uh, talking with uh, Research Central about the grant that they kind of put out for this summer as well, from a water conservation standpoint. It's an interesting group. <laughs> I'll also say one of the values of having a lot more community foundation as a partner is that they have some more flexibility in terms of how they can provide funding to folks too. So like, they work really hard to reduce those barriers for folks to be 
we, we think there's a lot of opportunity in that space that we haven't quite gone out, but we're, we're kind of, you know, we're still being on infrastructure right now. You're still doing a lot. <laughs> but we want to do so much more. Yes. <laughs> this is also, yeah, it's been a pet project that I would say Wayne and I for several years at this point. Yes, it has. <laughs> uh, okay, so getting to, uh, sorry, I'm going. Uh, no, that's fine. We have time. Okay, good. Uh, so getting kind of that schedule just gets a little bit more into kind of the community and the expectations here. Um, uh, so kind of the grant schedule, and again, this is brand new. Uh, uh, and so we, uh, yeah, we still have our neighborhoods getting used to it. Frankly, earlier in the year, we did not open it up for applications. Uh, the first time we did was the March, April application period. Uh, we did receive one application there, which, because we haven't had some of the infrastructure in place, we haven't actually been able to review yet. So it's outstanding. So what my goals is to hopefully, uh, uh, you know, Get the community together as soon as possible. Um, even as early as next week, if that's <laughs> a possibility, which will be a little bit off of schedule. But uh, since that is waiting, and there are some time sensitive elements to that uh, project, I, you know, I'm hoping, hoping we can really do that fairly quickly. Uh, but so you see, what we're just uh, uh, we accept applications at any time throughout the year, um, but there's basically five times a year when we actually review them. Uh, so you can see kind of a bi bi monthly basis. So if you take, for example, the January February funding cycle, uh, so the application is due to us on the first Thursday of that first month, so the first Thursday of January. We have a month where we kind of go back and forth and ask for revisions, etc., if necessary. Uh, any changes are due the first Thursday of the primary month, in this case February. Um, once those are reviewed, uh, uh, then uh, we. Uh, by the second Thursday, I'm sorry, this is a little company, that's my community graphic. By the second Thursday, we send it to committee members, uh, whether that's the SMS or to the NIP, um, uh, for give them uh, at least a few days, hopefully uh, up to a week, but at least uh, uh, four or five days to review those, uh, do a, a, a basic evaluation on them. Uh, and then um, we meet, uh, originally we had uh, scheduled that on the Wednesday before the third Thursday, um, before we realized that uh, that is today. Uh, and so the representative from this uh, uh, board probably wouldn't be able to attend. <laughs> uh, so we've tentatively moved that to Tuesday, uh, whereas that might be a burden on somebody to have to do two nights in a row, so we can discuss that. Um, uh, but that's kind of the expectation right now because of the rest of the, 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 the scheduling for that. Um, essentially, the, the, the SNS committee makes their decision on that the Tuesday. Um, the Thursday is the GLA meeting, so if it's an NIP project where a presentation is reported, that's where the community does a presentation. And then the week after that is where the NIP committee does their review. Uh, if they get through all that, then uh, we award the grant. As uh, so you can see, we have uh, two uh, more funding periods left, uh, the July and August. Uh, we did receive an application for, for that, so uh, we won't want to proceed with this schedule, um, at least for now. Uh, we will get that grant out to everybody by August 8th. Um, uh, it's still, a, it looks like a pretty solid grant. I don't think there'll be many changes we need to make before that date. Um, and then our uh, hope will be to have that formal meeting on the 13th of August. Uh, uh, for the for this the SNS committee, uh, and then there will be one one final round uh, in September October uh, with the SNS uh, committee meeting on October fifteenth. Uh, we do we, we don't do a um, November December um, uh, partially because we don't neighborhoods are not really focused on doing projects and applying for grants at that time. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, maybe cookies I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, although we have other grants for, for cookies. <laughs> Sorry. It's a bank. It's a bank. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't know. Are there sustainable cookies? Like, <laughs> they can be vegan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we do take that off. That's also gives our staff a little bit of time to do a lot of end of year uh, you know, work that we need to do and let's just kind of focus on that and get prepared for the next year. Uh, so I tried to make that fairly simple. Is that fairly clear? Calendar. I didn't include a lot, some of the other things because I didn't want to, it gets complicated very quickly. 
Yes. I'm not, I'm actually pretty interested in doing this, but I'm only going to be on this committee for one more year, so you have to have somebody reapplying in here. Uh, so that is up to you. Uh, okay. what, what we ask, and I'll talk about you know uh, expectations here in a minute. Uh, we haven't really set how that is. We kind of allow um, each group to define how they select their, their representative. Uh, so if you as a group are okay with that, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, really, my biggest interest is that we just always have a, uh, a representative. So does that representative attend the, the group MGLA meetings? Any or, any or some of them? They do not. But they're welcome to, uh, okay. but that's not necessary. It's just to participate in that selection process that we're right. just going to work. Yeah, that's the main priority is to review the grant applications and participate in the selection. And NGLA meetings have been monthly or quarterly? Uh, monthly, yeah. okay. third, third Thursday of every month. And is the, the whole public invited to those as well? Uh, technically, they're open to the public. We don't advertise them to the public. Okay. Uh, partially because when we have more neighborhood representatives that we can actually handle uh, in the space. Um, and we do sometimes talk about topics that uh, have some sensitive elements to them. Uh, and this could be difficult if you know, there's general public there. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're particularly open to it. Uh, we certainly be happy if any of you wanted to come on. Certainly, you're uh, welcome. So really quickly, the structure of that board, we have five voting members. Um, two of those members are HOA neighborhood representatives, one from an HOA neighborhood and one from an independent neighborhood. So we kind of get those varying interests uh, and voices on there. Uh, we have a representative from the business community um, uh, focused in the sustainability space. Um, uh, then uh, a member hopefully from the sustainability advisory board as well. Uh, and then also a, 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 a representative from the youth community Frankly, that's been quite a challenge uh, to, to, to get some of the committee to uh, do that. If, yeah. Uh, so that has largely been vacant, unfortunately. Uh, so right now, those are the two seats that are vacant at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, most of you will know that Jim has been serving uh, for the Sustainable Advisory Board, and a really great contribution. Uh, we're really grateful for it. Uh, and then there's also uh, two non-voting members, uh, would be the sustainability manager, so, so Lisa, um, and uh, the neighborhood resource coordinator, uh, who's going to suffer right now. We're really there want to be kind of the content experts, uh, aid in the conversation, the discussion, answer questions, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, we also serve, if there is a uh, kind of a tie in voting, we also serve as a type of Sir, what, how, uh, when you say youth community, how, what is, what's the definition of that? Uh, you kept it pretty broad. <laughs> uh, we have had, so we've had conversations with the St. Mary Valley School District. Um, we actually had uh, actually a couple representatives identified, but we were never kind of able to make that work. Uh, we looked at you know, the youth center, for example, would be uh, somebody, uh, we want somebody who is a member of the youth committee, so not necessarily someone who works with the youth community, but someone who can kind of bring that voice uh, into it and hopefully kind of encourage that leadership uh, in sustainability, kind of learning about it, and, you know, kind of starting to become more of a, a young sustainability leader and take that to, to the broader community. Uh, we, well, if you have ideas, we would agree with those. Wayne, is there a general age of the other? Uh, so we, we, we typically looked at at least 18 um, because they are, you know, this is a, a fairly professional process. Well, hopefully a highly professional process, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and, and just somebody who's kind of comfortable being able to get on. We, all, all of our meetings are virtual, I should mention that. Uh, kind of comfortable with those processes, kind of both kind of the maturity of going through this. But we kind of looked, I think, kind of in the 18, like high, you know, later high school to uh, college level. 2122 kind of space. Uh, so the committee itself and responsibilities. Uh, so we kind of cover this a little bit, but uh, one would be to review uh, uh, and evaluate applications prior to the meeting. So it's, we'll give you a, at least a few days, or hope to give you at least a week on those. Uh, um, uh, and that's kind of at your you know at your pace. You just do that on your own time. 
Uh, we do have kind of an evaluation document that will ask you to kind of just evaluate it on certain criteria, and I'll show you those here uh, in a second. Those aren't kind of final, we're not score based. So it's like, oh, here's the one that got the highest score. Those are kind of a guide for us to help review those and then come together and have a discussion and make a decision uh, as a committee about where to go on that. Um, so we'll have it in, in that meeting. Uh, uh, that's, that's the third Tuesday, basically. Uh, we'll have a discussion about those grants, come to a, a consensus. Uh, and then for the, for the SNS grants, that's the final award decision. Uh, for the, the sustainable improvement projects within the NIP, um, that decision then gets forwarded to the NIP committee, uh, and they must also review it. Uh, so if, if, if the SNS committee were to say, uh, for example, that this does not really meet the sustainability criteria, you know, that this is an appropriate project to fund, uh, then that wouldn't go to the NIP. Um, uh, and then so the award decisions that are available to the community, there's three different options. Uh, first uh, would be to simply approve the request to ask for votes. Uh, frankly, if, I think, if I've done my job working with the, the neighborhood, most of the grants should be there, uh, right? Um, but I also can't force them to do anything, and sometimes they, 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 they don't, or they, uh, I was wrong, right, in the interpretation that the committee would have. Uh, and you disagree well with me. Uh, the second would be to approve with a modified award or conditions. We've done this a few times where we felt that the grant that was being requested for the project really was too much, uh, that it wasn't justified. Uh, or two, as we've had a, a, a few more times recently, uh, is that um, where maybe the committee felt that they needed a little bit more information or there's some criteria they wanted to ensure was being met. Um, maybe a qualification of someone who's going to be hired to do this or something. And so they'll say, we'll approve this amount under the condition that this is met. Uh, or a few times they say, okay, we'll approve it, but Wayne, we want you to follow up on this piece with them. If that's met, we approve it. If not, then we don't. Uh, the third option would be to simply deny the funding. Uh, in either uh, two or three, um, the expectation is that the committee will provide uh, guidance on why it wasn't approved or why it was changed. Uh, and especially in the, in the case it was denied, because our goal is not to deny funding. Our goal is to give out as much funding as we can. Uh, to provide guidance on what could be changed about this application that would have made it approved. Uh, and choose a standard. Our hope is that then it's enough information that the neighborhood, if they so choose, could implement those changes, reapply, and then get that project to move forward. Um, so, real quick, I'll just go through what are those criteria that we uh, asked the committee to actually look at with these grants. Uh, it is the same basic criteria, a uh, couple minor changes as the NIP committee also uses. Uh, first one is just to look at what the overall application. Uh, you know, is this a good project? Is it put together well? Is the budget makes sense? Well justified, good quality project. Uh, second is that that, that benefits uh, from the SNS standpoint. It's the sustainability benefit specifically. With the other NIP grants, is is just you know, the kind of quality of life benefit is a general good public benefit. Uh, so that does it further one of those uh, fourteen sustainability categories. In, in some way, a sufficient way. Uh, <coughs> community participation, we expect this to be a collective process. Uh, so how has the broader community been involved or and shown support for the project? Uh, what we don't want is that there's a community leader, uh, maybe the HOA president is like, this is my project, I'm gonna do it, and just goes forward and does it. Or it just says, all right, everyone's okay with this, right? I'm gonna do this, we don't wanna fund that, right? We wanna know that the community's been involved, and they've set up a committee, um, those are our best projects where there's a lot of different interaction with the community. There's clear support for it. Um, we require a contribution. Um, uh, this is really a funding contribution. We don't require it in terms uh, of, uh, of financial dollars, though. They can contribute financially. They can contribute through uh, volunteer planning hours, through uh, uh, you know, the sweat equity, equity actually working on the project, um, uh, through you know donations, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's a number of ways to kind of meet that. Uh, we have, for the first time, implemented kind of a minimum uh, percentage that we expect. Uh, and I would say that's very much a minimum. We would expect to exceed that, uh, uh, especially with the way that we value volunteer hours. We can't meet that minimum. Uh, we should be probably should be that uh, Next is longevity. 
Um, if you want to see this grant before, you know we used to call it sustainability, which is very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so we changed to longevity, uh, really because the, the point of this, right, is that this is going to be a long lasting project. It's not going to be broken or not working in two years. There's a clear maintenance plan that it's going to last and, and be good use of uh, tax dollars. Um, and then uh, need. Uh, this is really establishing that if we don't, if, if we don't fund this, it's going to get it's going to get done anyway. You know, the HOA has the funding, and they're just going to do it. And they're going to go. We can save a few dollars. That's not really what we want to fund. Uh, we uh, you know if it's the HOA is like, well, we might do it, but it's going to take us three years to raise the funds to do this. Okay, that's probably still a need, right? If it's done sooner than later. Um, uh, so it's, it's really are they justifying that? This funding is going to help them get this project done. And, well, otherwise. Uh, and, and then finally, these are not necessarily uh, evaluation criteria, but they're kind of considerations that we include. Uh, our priorities are, you know, for creative projects, we want to fund creativity, we want to fund repl 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 replicability. Uh, I should come up with a different term for that apparently. Um, you know, those projects that uh, once it's done, we can capture that in the project library, and then other communities can easily kind of do this as well, right? Make this as easy as possible for these communities. Um, and then that holistic uh, sustainability goals, obviously. Uh, and so, uh, let's all, yeah. uh, so I'll say like time commitment. Uh, so obviously we, throughout the year, we have those five application periods. Um, our, uh, our, our review sessions have lasted maybe an hour, usually, depends on how many grants we review. Um, by spreading it out, we expect fewer grants per time, so shorter. Uh, and so, so probably half an hour to an hour, I would expect on that Tuesday. This stays on Tuesday, uh, and then maybe an hour or so, maybe a little bit more to do the actual review. Right? Obviously, if there's three grants, it'll take a little bit longer to do your individual review on your own time. Um, so, um, all told, maybe you know, like ten to fifteen hours per year. Expectation. Okay, sorry, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> 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 sorry, that was, that was great. I cut it down. It's usually a two hour presentation. I usually have like 50 <laughs> slides. I thought I was so proud. I cut it down so much. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about an organization that I work with called um, Community Connections Project. I don't know if you know about them. They're in, um, I'm not sure what the neighborhood is. Anyway, it's just north of the neighborhood I live in, and um, one of the focuses that uh, Director Karen has is she wants to start like an urban food forest project where folks are sort of gardening together and you know, sharing the produce, and something like that would need a tool library, um, and there's a facility there where they could be like kept and checked out and such. Is that the kind of project that you would be okay? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I mean obviously details, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. yeah, I think that, that could see would be a good project. Okay. Assuming they're a registered neighborhood, that would be the. Yeah, I'm not sure if it but if they're not, and this I'll is just an entry point for them to, yeah, she would go through that she, process. She probably doesn't even know about this. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned to Angie Lay to her before that she's got a lot of time, so I could help her get started. With that. And they have to go through that, so they have to go through the training to get registered. Somebody yeah. from that group, is that correct? Yeah, so there's a little bit of a, a time there to, to, yeah. And part of that is to also make sure that you know, there's a, a real commitment. Um, and we did, we changed our, we made an active neighborhood instead of just registered a few years ago. Because uh, we did see there were certain neighborhoods where we just register, never show up at a uh, you know, major meeting, didn't really think that they were doing kind of a collective, you know, uh, setting up meetings and those kind of things. They're really just applying for funding. So that would be changed that uh, criteria a few years ago. Just a simple logistics question. Now you said the meetings are all virtual. What time are they? Uh, they? So we can adjust that, but they have been at 5 o'clock uh, uh, last year. We haven't done any this year, obviously, because we've been doing the change. Um, but that, that's one of those things that we'll, 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 once we have the committee solidified, we'll kind of find the best time for everybody. If there's anyone rather than, other than me who wants to do this, raise your hand now. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly interested. I'm just curious. Uh, how did you come up with the uh, 
team members, I mean, two from NGLA, one from this board, one from business committee, and one from you. So, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, this is some more early conversations, our experience in general. And I think also partially going back to that kind of model uh, that I mentioned of uh, you know bringing those different sectors together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we really looked at uh, uh, you know like how we get that business community, the nonprofit community, the you know the the, the, the neighborhoods. How do we kind of get them so they're all part of this decision and all informed, right? Uh, the long term idea is that that's a way to help raise funds, right, by including the business community in it. Uh, that it's a way to kind of help those different communities be more informed about each other. You know, our hope is that we, you know, by having a, a business community member, that we can learn a little bit about, you know, sustainable businesses and that kind of thing can, you know, maybe inform this process, maybe inform projects a little bit. Um, the neighborhood representative, I mean, that's, that's a very obvious one. Right. Um, Robert, you should do it because I'm going to talk to my neighborhood and the neighborhood about your projects, and I'll be involved in projects that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do a project or vote on the project? I would do both. I would vote on my project. <laughs> <laughs> Yourself, I <laughs> we, we do have a conflict of interest clause. <laughs> um, we certainly have. I'm going to leave, and y'all get to get a vote on my project when I leave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll leave the cookies behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we actually have seen uh, committee, committee members who their neighborhoods uh, apply the question because yeah. they're the ones that are most informed and comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our difficulties is that we did launch during uh, COVID, so we were trying to educate people about a new grant program that was a little bit complicated they yeah. involve sustainability you know yeah. uh, projects that they may not know and something we're going into a lot is that people um i think this exists with sustainability in general right um but you don't know like sustainability this is great we want to do sustainability stuff and you're like okay what do you want to do like i have no clue what that really means like what is uh you know what is a neighborhood sustainability project um, even I think you know people who are very much committed and they agree. It's not always the easiest answer, which is really why we, we start focusing on the project library. We're like, you may be really committed to sustainability and still not really know how to put a neighborhood project together. So, it, like for example, I'm just gonna. I'll tell Karen to watch this after. This should be embarrassed that I brought it up. But CCP, if they had a staff member that wanted to coordinate. Could there be a little bit of money for them to coordinate the neighborhood, uh, or is it only going to be like for stuff? Is it just bricks and mortar or supplies? So to coordinate what? Exactly? So like could coordinate that urban, um, to coordinate the different plots. You know what I mean? And the gardening and to getting the neighbors together, putting together the meetings. So there definitely could be money for for planning. Okay. Um, yeah. The key there, and I should have said this before, is that it does have to be a neighborhood group. Right. Yeah. So they couldn't apply as the uh, community connected. Well, no, yeah. but they could be the site where this stuff could live. Because I think a lot sure. of these problems, the problem is that there's no, there's the neighborhoods don't have a community. You know, there's no like community shed. At, yeah. There's no space there. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a huge issue. We do a lot of projects in parks and that kind of thing. Right. In the independent neighborhoods. So they stay in space. In terms of like a local partner who could sort of provide a space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, potentially. One of our application questions is who owns the property and are they, you know, are they approving and agreeing that this is going to be publicly accessible okay. uh, for the neighborhood? Well, I'm, I'm not going to grab them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to grab them. I'm 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 going to grab them. i am Robert, I think you'd be vice chair, so <laughs> if you really want to make me do this. I second you. Okay. Well, yeah, so those are big chunks of money. So that's that Robert moved in within something. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of Mary having our representative. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. I was just curious, do we revisit it like when you're yeah, 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 yeah. So similar to we had Jim kind of give yeah. so for new folks, we did have Jim yeah. who was our representative yeah. give a little spiel last month yeah. about his um, experience, but we wanted to wait to have the new members come on to, to determine who. But honestly, I don't even see how this is going to get going unless the representative attends the NGO meetings. I think they have that has to happen regularly. 
just so that there's like there's an opportunity to sort of like talk to people and get to know them and just be that extra and I've been wanting to attend the do and meetings anyway. So I think that, that would be my approach which is what you know. Well thanks Wayne. Thanks Wayne for your time. Um, I'll let you maybe connect with Mary otherwise I'm happy to send you your contact info but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I will ask, do you think that you could do a, a review next week? Yes. I really want to get this going to be a, a response. Well, I like this more and more about grants for some reason. There you go. I mean, it used to be in the past, but it's okay. All right, well, um, moving on to pro projects launched during COVID <laughs> and we are also seeking volunteers for. Um, we also have the Sustainable Opportunities Lifestyle and Leadership Program, which we also do in partnership um, with Wayne and Yearville from the Community Neighborhood Resources Team. That's a program that launched during COVID and took a little while to get off the ground, as you can imagine, um, sending volunteers into other people's Homes to do sustainability assessments was a little bit difficult to sell during that for quite a long period of time. Um, but we really got through that program pretty well established. We have a new sustainability coordinator, I guess not new that new anymore. Oh, wow. <laughs> two years, not new at all. I was like a year, but yeah, it's been two years. Um, so Zach Lance, he comes to these meetings sometimes, uh, but he's the our Sustainability coordinator focused on residential programs, so he that's his, one of his like, main focus areas. And he wanted me to put a call out to all that we're looking for uh, volunteers uh, for that program in particular. Uh, so we're looking for bilingual English speaking volunteers, Spanish English speaking volunteers, um, folks who are passionate about the environment, sustainability community to be a volunteer sole sustainability ambassador. Uh, so you'll receive an in-depth training on sustainable lifestyle best practices, community resources, and environmental rebate programs. And then you go out in pairs to conduct sustainability assessments for Longmont residents. So going into people's homes, um, doing those assessments, talking to folks. Sometimes that involves helping like, point people in, in the direction of resources and whatnot. Um, and that would start in September, so folks are asked to commit at least a year of service um, that is around eight hours a month. So it definitely is, is more of a commitment than what Wayne was talking about, um, but the schedules are pretty, pretty flexible. So if folks are interested, I provided Zach's contact information in the memo that went with that description. So um, do you all have any questions sure. about so what kind of expertise do you need to have to do this? Is it just passion? It is mostly passion, yeah. So we'll do it, and I tap Wayne because Wayne helps run those training programs, but I mean, we'll train you on everything that you need to know. I think it's more about the passion and the desire to support community members, and there's definitely some, um, I think, cultural sensitivity and competency kind of components of, of that, but Wayne, do you want to jump in and add to anything? Which it's not like in-depth technical okay. stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's mostly kind of basic stuff. Uh, well, it, it varies, um, but we also try to, when we do volunteers, we try to combine them, uh, you know, so, so they complement well, and we look at what the household is interested in. Uh, so, for example, one of our volunteers is an HVAC specialist, so the, the household is kind of interested in those, those factors, we make sure that he goes on that visit. Um, yeah, the training will kind of include that. We actually have kind of a matrix of sustainability of behaviors is kind of split up by each of the sustainability topic areas and also by are they kind of like a beginner this person doesn't know anything they're just interested or maybe they're just interested in saving money right um to kind of come kind of intermediate to advanced those uh, uh kind of first adopters we go to that have solar and uh, we've had people who have set up like really crazy engineering like tracking everything in their own um, so that we kind of adapt to those. But yeah, if you weren't really comfortable, you know, initially we're not going to send you to that, to that complicated household. But in, in the training, we're really looking at doing a little bit kind of more um, a hybrid style of uh, uh, the, you know, you have a chance to kind of at your own pace, uh, absorb that kind of training on the actual uh, issues. And then in-person trainings would be more about kind of the cohort and getting to know each other and uh, some of those, those, those processes, how to actually go into a home and, and what to consider. 
Although we would accept you to go in and install firms on the energy resource management systems and connect them to people's washing machines. There you go. There, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, but it is definitely one of those situations, too, that we try to make sure that folks are prepared with different resources. As you talk to folks, you may discover you know, that folks that really um, benefit from knowing how to apply for SNAP, or maybe folks who know that the bus system is free, or you know those sorts of things. So it's like you know people start to talk to you about different things and be prepared to know I nominate Robert as I was representing. We don't have to have an actual representative for that. But I have a few friends you, who I think would be really yes, interested. Yes, please. If, yeah, if you all it. are interested or know folks that are interested, um, Ralph, I go back to your comment earlier about you know education and engaging people. This is a really great program. It's one that I think you know is definitely a word of mouth. Like most neighbors have experiences and starting to talk to their neighbors about stuff so we're really trying to you know build build that kind of any the home energy efficiency or is it other programs wayne do you want to jump what was the, what was the question oh, i was just wondering if it's like mainly the i know my neighbor did like the home energy efficiency um the energy i just wondering if it's anything else was it the energy, energy audit, audit yeah, that that's it? yeah yeah yeah, our, our goal, uh, we rarely achieve this, but is to uh, to touch on all each of the 10 sustainability topic areas in some way through the visit. A lot of time we just run out of time for that. Um, so certainly within energy, we try to connect them with what you know, those resources, with uh, uh, efficiency works, etc. cetera. We, we, we do some in-home kind of upgrades, you know, we'll install light bulbs, do some of those kind of basic things. We use those more as kind of conversation starters uh, as well. But yeah, we try to we try to touch on all of those. It does end up being like water, energy, you know, kind of heavy. Um, but it kind of depends on the household and what, what resonates with them. We'll include whatever uh, we can. Do people need to be bilingual? We we are looking for folks. I know you can tell me if we're looking for not only will folks, but right now the the big focus is really we're starting to to get more interest from the Spanish speaking community, and we want to make sure that we have more volunteers that can be available. Guillermo from Wayne's team is bilingual, and so he's been supporting a lot of those, but we're trying to expand that capacity and get much more into the neighborhoods. Yeah, I, I would say that bilingual is our priority. Okay. Uh, we're really trying to adapt the program right now so that we can uh, uh, better meet kind of Spanish speaking households. Uh, but if you're interested, we would love to know and hear from you. And so please, even if you're not bilingual, you know, let us know. Turkish doesn't come. Um, it does at some point. I, <laughs> I, just, I just learned that we have what sixty-eight, I think, different uh, countries represented in Hong Kong. People come from, so yeah, yeah. I think Hindu is probably our next uh, <laughs> target. Okay, so um, a couple of events that I just wanted to highlight for you all that are coming up. So tomorrow. Um, we have both our Plastic Pollution Solutions event, in case folks didn't know, it's Plastic Free July. Um, so folks from our team in partnership with some community partners um, and the library are hosting that event um, here at the Civic Center at 6 o'clock. And then also, if you want to come um, early, there's also the Transportation Mobility Plan Open House that's starting at 5.30. I have a session about the room. Uh, 5 30 to 7 at the library and then 6 to 7 30 over here at the civic center so an evening of sustainability if you all want to come out for that we would love to see you and then the, our next sustainability coalition meeting is on august 8th um so that is 6 5 15 to 6 45 and the, those meetings are virtual so um if you haven't been to one of them before or in a while it's a great um opportunity to uh, we usually do some general sustainability updates. We try to highlight a partner that's doing work in sustainability, and then it's just a good networking opportunity for folks from across the community that are engaging in sustainability and all kinds of things. So it's an opportunity as well. And then what I didn't have on here, but that I wanted to share with you, is Jack Solar Garden, who I think probably everyone might be familiar with. Is there anyone that's not familiar with Jack Solar Garden? It's an agrivoltaic project. Um, I think it's technically has a long mountain address, but not in the city limits, is that correct? Um, so they are having an event on July 27th, 
uh, called Harvesting Home, which is in Karen Boulder County's Food and Energy Future from 9 to 1, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's $5 per person to go to Jackson River. So um, check that out. There will be folks from Long Power and Communications, I believe, there, um, and folks from the county. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention was a follow-up from that Westminster group that pulled together the regional sustainability or environmental boards from across the region. So several months ago, for those of you that are new, um, we had folks from the Westminster <coughs> Board of Environmental Affairs um, or Advisory Board, I can't remember exactly what their title is, reach out to say they were interested in connecting with other similar boards from across the region just to get a sense of what are the priorities that different groups are working on and are there opportunities to potentially do some collaboration. Uh, so um, both Ralph and Mary from this group attended to just kind of give some overviews of, of what the priorities from this board are, um, recognizing that you know, this board very much serves as a council advisory board and you know is directed by the priorities of city council. Um, so we have some constraints within that. Um, but they sent a follow-up email recently where they put together a survey that they're asking folks to fill out, um, not as a board member, but as uh, just an individual from the community that is interested and engaged in sustainability and environmental work. Um, so that was the, the email that I was referring to last month that I was a little bit con confused at. Um, so I will send that on to you all. Uh, I think the deadline for completion of that survey is in the next week or so, so I'll make sure you all get that. Uh, and then as far as I understand, or Ralph and Mary, correct me if you have a different understanding, is that group is going to otherwise meet quarterly, although I haven't heard anything about that. They have not been communicating with me at all. They okay. sent me one member of the group sent me an accidental email that indicated to me that there was a meeting happening that night. Yeah, it's a little confusing to me as well, so I will just keep you apprised if I hear anything from them. Um, but otherwise, I will at least send you all the survey. I haven't looked at it, so I don't know what questions are there. Maybe yeah, there's I think I will reach out to Maria Rotondo, who is okay. the person, right. just uh, tomorrow and send okay. a message over to see what the heck is going on. We're not Thanks. getting any communication, and then I'll share that through Heather or Lisa. Yeah, and get perfect. Okay. okay. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate that. All right, I think that's everything for me. I'm just going to hand it back to you, Chair. Uh, yeah, do we have any yeah. items from the board all the way on? Okay, thank you. Um, we got this orientation packet, and it's quite outdated. It's like 20 pages. Can we get that updated? That's a great question. I think that's probably a question. Yeah. Um, we can follow up with them. I don't know. Yeah. Um, do you have more specifics of like what I haven't honestly looked at that for a while? I don't know. Well, just lots of charts of the job positions and how they flow together and yeah. contact information. I assume that a lot of those too. This is 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It says Brian Bagby is the mayor. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ethan, for bringing me to our attention. Like everything but the red head. I'll look yes, to it. see if you have a more updated one available. Um, okay. Yeah. And if not, we can at least let the clerk's office know. I, I did try to make sure at least what I was sending to you was the most updated version that I have, but clearly I have not looked at it for a while. So, yeah. Oh. Is there something else, Ethan? Yeah. Um, making the public feel welcome is an important part of the democratic process. And this board embraces diverse perspectives from the public. We say that we want to create an inclusive space where everyone feels welcome to share their opinion. But the board's process for public comment feels restricted and exclusive to members of the public. And we see that feedback directly. Um, because unlike the city council, which allows open access to public comment, this board requires advanced registration for public comment for virtual meetings. It does not enable open access for public observation of those meetings. This could be perhaps construed as an Open Meetings Act violation. Accordingly, I would like to motion for this board to use the same rules as City Council, allowing open access and at least few minutes per speaker for residents of the city. 
and those opening up access to non-residency, maybe some of grant experts or concerned agencies or user of city services. I can, I can put that on the agenda for a future meeting for folks to, to revisit since we have new members of the board and a bunch of other. I know we have some concerns because of the board, the virtual meetings and why it's set up the way that it is. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, um, we don't have sufficient um, licensing for all of our public, our, all of our meeting advisory boards to be streamed, uh, live streamed meetings. And um, they chose to do the ones that typically have more public comment and engagement um, to use that live stream uh, account for that purpose. Um, so I mean, that, that, was, a, that creates a non virtuous cycle where if they're not live streamed, then there's not going to be purchase. Um, I have not found that this board has not had sufficient access to people who want to be included in the meeting so um, we do put out the agenda um, several days in advance um, with the re uh, request that people contact me if they're interested in participating I have not found that to be an issue of um, people who want to be included in the meeting who have never have not been able to gain access to that. I've heard it um, a lot of times that I've, I've heard it from a lot of people that the, the process is, is cumbersome. That they want to be able to just show up virtually to the meeting without having to register ahead of time. And that Unfortunately, the way our account works, um, we are not able to do that at this time. So one of the things that could happen is this board could decide to do all of their board uh, meetings in person, which would open it up to the public to be able to, um, to come to every meeting. So I would like to move that we, we consider that as well because I don't, I, I mean, I live four blocks from here. I'm going to have to go to all of the years. It's almost two hours session that I'm staring at the computer. So well, um, we can, I would like to move that we put that on the agenda just to discuss for now that we have a new board. Second. I have a question about that. I'm not sure who you addressed to you about. Um, I travel a lot for business and I've been able to attend the virtual meetings from wherever I was. So as long as there's a quorum, what is the rule? I, I wouldn't want to have this impact. I think there's a lot of value to meeting in person, really. Um, but how would it work? For instance, could I still attend virtually if it's an in-person meeting? That is something that the board would have to vote on to put into their bylaws. Currently, we don't have space for that in our bylaws, but it is something that you all could do. Um, I could tell you from the water board because I'm the reporting secretary for that board as well. They meet in person each month, but they have made it accessible um, if if there's an uh, extenuating circumstance for a board member that needs to attend remotely, that the board members are allowed to uh, um, attend remotely, but everybody else would need to be um, in person because it's much easier to logistically take care of all of that kind of stuff. Um, so in other words, the public could call it. Correct. Okay. Well, so I, I, I made a motion. If someone wants to second it, it's not second. Well, did. I was just going to ask for the question before we vote or anything. Uh, we did just reevaluate our in-person mm -hmm. remote stuff. Yeah. Like, At the beginning of the year. Tell us what it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be helpful for the new members to be brought up to date on that as well. Mm -hmm. Do we revise your motion as hybrid? Sure. Am I understanding correctly when you say so if we did move to a hybrid model, that, that does create the opportunity where the public can join virtually? No, it the does. public would need to be in person. In um, person. It, it's much easier logistically to run it if the board member, if a board member needs to be remote, for example, if Ralph were traveling or Robert were traveling, I know he does that yeah. at times, or you're sick or something and you're yeah. not be able to attend in person, that you would let me know we could set it up for you to join virtually but it's much easier to only have public access one way or the other not both so this it would be essentially the same system as city council yes i believe that which that where if people are on vacation or sick and they don't want to be in person they but the public has to show up yes. for the 
person to be. Yes. So and there is a precedent in the city. And what's the what's the hurdle to the public joining the meetings virtually? Like the live stream? What's the license? We thing? we don't have the um, license for our account to be able to do the live streaming. So it's budget mm -hmm. yeah. And so that might be an advisory meeting to the council to request yeah. the the budget to support that. Because I, what I'm what I'm thinking is that just thinking in the big picture of accessibility, uh, and we actually just did this with City of Boulder was was that the virtual option for the public was the most appealing and accessible for members of the public, especially for meetings that are happening so closely with the work hour. Um, so that's what I'm wondering is if there's if there's a a longer arc here where we might be requesting the budget to make sure we have the license for folks to join virtually. I know that can also help. Facilities wise, too, is that there's a particularly um, hot topic that might be attracting. So, so folks. Daniel, so if we revise a second time and say, and mm -hmm. let's add this to the discussion as well, we might. Okay. Uh, well, and that's what I'm wondering, because I think the so hyper. So, Michelle, it's your job to be saying. Yeah, I, I would think that that would be a separate motion. I don't think that, okay. I mean, the conversation is just to um, discuss the. Accessibility yeah. to it, so I don't think that it needs to be part of the motion that was already on the board as far as, um, you know. Okay, so let's vote that and then Daniel can go at the well, same meeting we talked about. Yeah. I mean, it could just okay. be part of the discussion, it doesn't need to be a separate motion, in my opinion. That it's a motion to discuss at the next meeting the well, accessibility we are, for board and public. so the motion on the table is to discuss the public accessibility piece of it right. yeah. that could be part of that conversation and doesn't need to be a separate topic then. okay so we should review the option do you want to restate it um we have it that you're so, wanting to put it on the agenda i would like to put on the agenda yeah. that we have a group discussion yeah. towards changing our um, or, or our procedures, our standard operating procedures um, um, towards greater public accessibility um, and including a hybrid, well, we don't even have to ask yeah, what we we're saying, yeah. which is all part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Uh, all those in favor? All right. Any opposed? This will be good. Don't play me Any further discussion? Do you want to share anything on this? Oh, I, my, my thoughts are just, yeah, we, we talked about it before. I think we, we created this in person uh, to try to drive more opportunities yeah. for the public to participate. And I don't know that it's been as successful as we hoped. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm certainly. My vote no is not because I don't want public participation. It's just I think that, I think we've tried a lot of avenues. I'm not sure we're going to find the right answer, but I'm eager for a vigorous discussion since the rest of the reports. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to vote no. One other quick question. Um, how far back do the minutes go? Do you have archives of the minutes for this board that could go back to the family or all of the history? all of the history um, history of the minutes of this board are available um, through the um, portal records portal, so you can access those through there. We did change the name from uh, this board changed their name in two thousand nineteen, I think, to the Sustainability Advisory Board. And prior to that was a board of environmental affairs, so you'll find them in those two categories on the um, public portal for our records. Can I add that actually in regards to records too? So, um, as an advisory board, we are not subject to Colorado Open Meetings Law, correct? We are. Yeah, we, we are, are subject. Yes. We, we, we got a legal opinion on that this yeah. year. Perfect. That's in question. <laughs> I actually don't think we should be because we are only in an advisory capacity. I looked at the regulations, but the, but the city attorney's office said we are. I, I'm not sure it. that's yeah. correct, but we are. Right. And then, of course, all of our documentation is also for our protected right, correct? So anything sent to our personal emails, um, that, that's also that's also if records is, we need to preserve. If it is board related, yes. Okay. Sometimes um, one of the recommendations that City Council has made is um, 
suggestion for board members to create a separate email address for board correspondence that only that email stuff would be subject to the CORA law yeah. instead of um, you know having to sit through all your personal stuff as well. So, yeah. And just a reminder for, for new folks in case you didn't have a chance to look regarding CORA that, that is very much so if you all if you all have a or have correspondence you want to share with the entire board that needs to come through Heather or I to send to folks as ACC because anytime it's more than two board members it's yeah it's considered you have a great switch for it off the way. Indeed, yes. All right. Okay. Um, is that the motion to adjourn? Yes. That's all I to adjourn. Did you make it? Yep. Motion to adjourn. I'm making a motion to adjourn. That's okay. All those in favor? All right. Thank, Thank you, you everyone.